give a warm welcome to Jared Miller. Children to God. My name is Jared Miller and I'm the archivist for the Cherokee National Archives and uh, Cherokee National Historical Society. And I'll talk about the difference here in a minute. But first off, I want to start off with a little story. Uh, the years back in 2002, and I was just a stupid starving student going to junior college, fresh out of the army. And I was involved with the local Native American Student Union and there was a grand total of about eight of us. So we had received a call and the call was, hey Jared, could you present at an interfaith gathering? And I go, well sure. So I go to the interfaith gathering and it's uh, Thanksgiving, I think back in 2002, and they say, by the way, where's your powwow group? Where's your drums? Where's your dancers? And, and I said, well, I exactly. And they want a stereotype, and I go, well, I've never done public speaking. There's 500 people I'm presenting to, so I guess we're going live on this, and I'm going to talk about stereotypes. So it, it was a, uh, let's just say I had went over a very tense audience on the topic of Native Americans and mainstream society, and I don't think California was ready for it at this moment. So. Luckily, I'm in the Cherokee Nation, and I'm going to talk about another stereotype, and it's the Cherokee National Archives, its past, collections, and future. First off, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Charles Gord. He is our executive director at the Cherokee Heritage Center. So, I'd also like to acknowledge Ruby Wells. She is the only records manager at Cherokee Nation. She's been employed for over 40 years with the nation. So, and she's, her job in the archives process is she maintains the documents at the warehouse before they go to the Cherokee National Archives. So there's a very important process where we're basically like unicorns. There's only two of us, one at one end and one at the other. And you hear about us, but you never actually see us, usually because we're working. So I get a lot of phone calls of what is an archivist. And well, first off, it's a professional with a bachelor's, continuous training in the field, and additional education. Right now, I'm working on my master's in museum studies and library information sciences from the University of Oklahoma. So when I get home from work up until 11 o'clock at night, I'm working. On the weekends, I'm working. So I really don't get a break. The other thing we focus on is, you know, archives is, in a general term, is usually paper, usually the historical documents. So we assess it, we collect it, we organize it, we preserve it. We maintain the controls, controls over it because it is such a historically significant record. I get all choked up uh, just thinking about it. There's a lot more to it, but this is kind of uh, the layman's terms for archives, or archivists anyway. Archives, so what is an archives? I get phone calls all the time having people call up and ask, well, where's my genealogical records? and they want to know their family history, their family lineages. And for the most part, uh, archives doesn't maintain genealogical information. But in some historical documents, like letters between correspondents, you're going to find information about some folks, but it's usually your higher tiered individual that are working in the government. Maybe they're a post office clerk, a principal chief, something of that significance. So a repository is either physical or virtual. The field of archives has changed. Traditionally, it was a house building. Now with um, the digitization of our world and clouds and other such things, now we're finding it on the website. We're finding it in a virtual piece of the world because the field has changed so much so since I came in in 2005. And I'll give this as an example. In 2005, we were taught, okay, you're going to scan your documents at 300 DPI, which means dots per inch on a scanner. And you're going to save it in an Adobe PDF format. Now, 
what we're doing is we're scanning at 600 dpi and we're saving it in a tiff format now that's just right now we're going we're about ready to jump to the next level where it'll be 1200 dpi but i want to remind the audience that digitization is not a means of preservation it, it's a means that longevity of that original paper source document is important because what happens when you when you digitize you're migrating it from one software to the next and every time you open it what happens is it resaves itself eventually it becomes splotchy and what that means is you you've lost data so that's why the preservation of our historical documents are so important that means generally um, putting in an acid-free paper you want to maintain temperature control control relative humidity uh, a lot of boring stuff but for the archivist it's a it's a good time <laughs> uh, let's see we house primary source documents or duplicates because of their cultural historical or evidentiary value a lot of people don't think of judicial determinations in the court system uh, as being historical significant but we are a nation of laws at the federal level the state level the municipal level and there is an evidentiary component that needs to be had with those decisions um, also cultural and historical a lot of times you'll see things that for example in Cherokee documents back in the 18th century that were obviously done in commonplace then that we no longer do for that reason alone that document needs to be preserved. It's a key to our lineage, to our past. And hopefully it will be there for our future. Archives is about as much perpetuating as it is preserving. Preserving is just putting it up on a shelf like some jam. But everybody's going to eat that jam eventually. Somebody's going to want to research that. And that's where we come into. Archives includes paper documents, so that would be like letters, memos, legislative acts, manuscripts, um, geographic maps, blueprints, schematics, audio media. And when I mean audio media, I mean we're talking to the old 19th century anthropologists that would go out and record songs on wax cylinders. So we're talking technologically then to technologically now. So your MP3, MP3 uh, for example, software, where you listen to music now, that's gonna be history at some point and it's gonna find its way into the archive. So we also have visual media and that can be film reel. Everybody remain, remembers beta, you know, the real tiny VHS that you would put. It really didn't get, it didn't get the, its proper due in technology. You know, we're always looking for something smaller and beta should have been the way but instead, the American public chose VHS and Super VHS. Then it went to Laserdisc. Everybody remembers Laserdisc. It lasted for about two years. Now we have DVD, then it went to Blu-ray. And of course, archives is photographs. Photographs tell as much about our history as any document does. It captures a moment in time where maybe somebody's making a funny face. Maybe there's a building that burns down. It captures that point in time, and those photographs are important for their historical significance. So now let's talk Cherokee National Archives, because that's just a broad definition for archives. And here's our purpose, and it's going to differ from the Cherokee Heritage Center's mission statement. The Cherokee National Archives' purpose is to preserve, promote, and teach Cherokee language, history, and culture through its archives and collections with emphasis put on preservation. Uh, I gotta say, first and foremost, I wanna apologize to the Cherokee people because we haven't put enough emphasis on our language. Our language is our entire basis for sovereignty. It made us a distinct people. And for that reason, we're gonna reach out and create a section of our archives dedicated solely to centralizing Cherokee documents in the syllabary. We're gonna make this right. Uh, there is a duality that I talked about earlier. The Cherokee National Archives is the official repository of the Cherokee Nation government documents and has been 
by tribal law since 1985 and is covered under the 1585 Act. The other part is the Cherokee National Historical Society Incorporated. A lot of people don't know that the Cherokee Heritage Center is a nonprofit 5013C. So it's independent of the tribe. It's its own state-driven state nonprofit. And a lot of people don't know that. They think the Cherokee Heritage Center is with the nation, that, that it is a part of the nation. And it has a complicated history that goes back to when the tribe was just coming about getting back on its feet when we had a chief for a day. And before we formally reestablished our government, the Cherokee Heritage Center came about because like-minded people wanted to create that, but there was no government entity at the time really to do that. So that's why they entered into the state nonprofit. Okay. At times, the Cherokee National Archives includes the artifacts and objects from the Cherokee National Historical Society. So by traditional definition, an archives is your paper, your audio collections. It would include something like Stan Wadey's Bowie knife. But by virtue of definition, because of the Cherokee National Archives, we include that in our collections. As we're going, to, as alluded earlier, we're getting ready to build a new archives facility. Those collections will actually be housed in conjunction with our archives. So it creates a, a unique definition for our Cherokee people. Now I want to go into the history of the Cherokee National Archives. And this is, I did a little research because I want to find out where, did, where is the origins of our Cherokee National Archives. And believe it or not, it first started in 1763 back in the old country by Stalking Turkey. Now a lot of people don't know, Stalking Turkey was mentioned in uh, the diary of Lieutenant Henry Timberlake. And he was one of three Cherokees to go over to London. So that probably inspired him to collect up what he thought was of significant historical value. And what we do know, and this was based off of J.R. Alden, he wrote um, the 18th century Cherokee archives for the American Archivist, which is a scholarly publication back in 1942. So he states that there was historical documents that included wampum belts, wampum strings, Bronze medal is a King George, so that would be the British equivalent for the Indian Peace Medals. There was correspondence from 1763 to 1778 from uh, Lord, Lord Dun, Dunmore, excuse me, excuse me, um, John Stewart, the famous Patrick Henry, the American Patriot, and others. There was a treaty that was included, which wasn't named, so we don't know specifically what treaty that might have been an abstract, and a map of Vandalia. And Vandalia was a proposed colony for the British government that never manifested itself. So what happened to it? Well, gentleman, American military officer by the name of Colonel Arthur Can Campbell and uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Severe happened. And basically they went in with 700 American militiamen and invaded Cherokee Nation in late uh, 1780. At, at December 28th, Chota was burnt to the ground. So what we do know is Stalking Turkey manages to save the archives and its collections from burning, but later abandons it in the chaos. I imagine him just running for his life you know, and he's, he's got all this stuff and he's weighed down and he sees the Americans and he's probably like, man, I, it's either me or this. And he's like, ah, what do I do? It's this. No, no, no. So he keeps running. So, and how we know this happened was Colonel Campbell writes to Thomas Jefferson on January 15th, 1781. And we find stalking turkeys, uh, and here's the, uh, the quote from the letter. Let me get my, I got a real monotone voice, so we're going to have to bear with me for a second. But we find stalking turkey's baggage, which he left behind in fright, various manuscripts, copies of treaties, commissions, letters, 
and other archives of the nation. So we have documented Cherokee archives and we have documented stealing of our archives by an invading army which at the time was America because we were considered a foreign government at the time. Or maybe they were foreign, I think that's a better way of putting it. So what was in the baggage? Believe it or not, in this letter to Thomas Jefferson, there's a list. So we have a list of these historically significant items. So somebody intentionally went in and inventoried these. Here's some more of the list. So where are these documents now? I haven't gone to further look for them, but what I do know is there's probably two, two possible locations, which would be the Library of Congress or the National Archives. And that is our governmental property. Now granted, it was a spoil of war, but it's still ours. So, my reply would be, got NAGPRA? And for those of you that don't know, NAGPRA is the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. And what we have is cultural patrimony. There's a clear lineage of it as a government to government relationship with the correspondence with the treaties. Our wampum belts, we don't know if they were a political or sacred nature, and they're discussed. So by all rights, it is ours. It is our communal cultural property. And I recently came back from ATOM, which is the Archives Tribal, Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums group, and a great week-long conference. If everybody gets the chance to, please do so, because there's like-minded indigenous folks there in the field. But one of the issues I asked the federal government who handles NACPRO was, would our, for example, our ledger books that are written in the syllabary and our government documents be considered cultural patrimony? And they said it would. That's theoretical, of course. Okay. Now we're getting closer to the 21st century. There's, uh, I'm trying to get this through, I only have an hour, and there's so much history involved. And which is great, because you know, archivists, you love history. So, the first mention in the mid 60s, um, to be exact, Cherokee Nation's Executive Committee on January 26, 1963, establishes a Cherokee National Archives, but it's at the expense of our tribal attorney, Earl Boyd Pierce. So he was our attorney at the time. He was our tribal lawyer. Um, we were still chief for a day system where W.W. Keeler was our appointed principal chief. We hadn't yet established our contemporary government where we have tripartite judicial, legislative, and executive. And the archives was actually housed out of his office in Fort Gibson, and it was by donation. So this is our origins, this is our lineage. So gradually we're building up, like just think if we would have had a continual lineage from stalking Turkey to now where we'd be. I think we'd be a race of archivists maybe. And we can't get them? Oh, we can. <laughs> it's do we want to follow that course? And my archives is apolitical, I treat everything apolitical, and I believe it's a community driven focus. It, it, what I do is preserve documents, but I preserve it for our Cherokee Nation citizens. And they are the ones I work for. So everything I do, I do with a servant's heart. It's what you guys want to happen for our archives. So now I'm going to talk about the 1585 Cherokee Legislative Act. Now, this was passed on October 12th, 1985. And it's very important because it's still on the books, it's still tribal law, but I, I want to put a disclaimer here. At the time this was passed, we were just building ourselves back up. There was more pressing issues than the archives. There was housing, there was education, there was health care. We didn't have the casinos. There wasn't 365,000 of us. There wasn't a billion dollar infrastructure and a powerhouse at play. Cherokee Nation was still just getting off its feet. So 
What the 1585 Act does, it creates an Archives and Records Commission made up of the Principal Chief, who is the Chair, the Executive Director of the Cherokee National Historical Society, and one Tribal Council member. The Commission is the sole authority for the use and distribution of all public records and archives of Tribal officers, departments, commission, agencies, and institutions in Cherokee Nation. But Here's an interesting thing. It excludes recognized clans and organizations in Cherokee Nation. For example, if the Ani Galohi, the long-haired clan, was a recognized body within Cherokee Nation, which it is ceremonially, socially, and culture culturally, they could maintain separate records that would not fall under this act. Or organizations like, um, let's say, the National Republican Committee if there's one in Cherokee Nation, we can't govern that because of, because of the wording in this law, and we probably wouldn't want to. Okay, now, there's other things that the 1585 Act um, covers. It covers the commission, an advisory committee, intellectual property, and I'll kind of break it down. So, the commission establishes policies and procedures for storage processing, and servicing records. So what that means is, basically it says, where's it going to go, how's it going to be processed, and who services it. It makes up provisions for preservation, arrangement, re repair, and I find this one very interesting is reproduction. And reproduction back in the 80s was scanning, you know, pre-Xerox. So now we're digitizing. So. The 1585 Act had that foresight to look at now and see where our science, our archival science was moving towards. So it's as much now relevant as it was in 1985. Now, the interesting thing about the advisory committee, it's established by the commission. Um, and it's to consult and make recommendations. So these are chosen from leading from leading li archivists, librarians, political scientists, and historians. So there's a community-driven focus within the 1585 Act. It also states that there will be reimbursed for those folks for transportation and other expenses, just like a Cherokee Nation employee would. So that's no different from our gaming commission and other such things that get stipend for their meetings. Now, I want to talk about intellectual property. Now, intellectual property is essentially the author who creates the document. It's like a copyright, more or less. It is your property. Now, with that said, the 1585 Act says, once documents reach the custody of the commission, no party within Cherokee Nation is liable for infringement of property rights arising from materials being displayed, inspected, researched, or reproduce. So what that's saying is once it comes into the Cherokee National Archives, it becomes the communal collective property of Cherokee Nation. Now, you know, we have anthropologists that go out and they research our communities and they write books. Now what's interesting about that is they're using our culture to either advance themselves in academia, or what they're doing is they are looking at a way to make money. That's their intellectual property. But actually, as Cherokee people, that's our intellectual property because it's our culture they're writing about. And I think that needs to be addressed. And I say that because if my undergraduate degree was in anthropology. so. I might be a rogue in the field. Now, there's some more about the 1585 Act. It's um, the commission that's made up of the principal chief, our executive director, and one tribal council member is to meet annually at least and transmit results to the tribal council. Now, they, they have the authority to design, construct, purchase, lease, maintain, operate, protect, and improve buildings used by the commission for the storage of governmental and archival records. So we have that foreshadow again of what can be done to create an archives place. 
And our historical documents are living beings in a sense. They breathe, they take in what's around them. So think about something toxic. You know, we've all been around toxic culture, toxic people. Uh, you know, we take it in and it creates something bad in us. But if you put, for example, an archival document in acid-free paper, if you nurture it, if you control its relative humidity and temperature, it's going to last 1,200 years versus 40 years. So there's a big distinction. With a lot of love, you thrive. Okay, I think this is the last one on the 1585 Act because it's, it's a dry read. <laughs> so the Attorney General's office is covered. It states, any public records or archives illegally removed which was formerly part of the records or files of any public office of the Cherokee Nation falls within this purview for its return. So I want to walk you back to when they, they allotted us. All our government records pre-statehood are with the Oklahoma Historical Society right now. I don't fault them one bit because if they wouldn't have preserved it, we wouldn't have them to this day. But as we advance towards being self-sustaining as an archives with a new archives facility, maybe we should open up a dialogue about returning them home and actually getting us to where we need to be. If we focus on Cherokee governmental records, we should have them housed entirely together. You know, we're, we're rebuilding the Cherokee Nation, so maybe we should rebuild its history as well in the realm of documents. Now, Cherokee National Archives is also covered. It establishes it on October 12, 1985. It states in the 1585 Act that it's permanently located on the grounds of the Cherokee National Historical Society. It's also the official repository for all public records and archives of tribal officers, departments, commissions, agencies, and institutions of the Cherokee Nation. And it states also that an emergency exists in the act. So 1985 says, hey, hey, we got this emergency, you know, the roof is on fire, but we're not putting water on it. So it immediately necessitates the need for the act. It states that it takes effect and is to be in full force from its passage and approval. It also says, if any wordage is unconstitutional, remaining portions of the act are considered valid. So what that tells me is we might mess up on a couple words here or there, but still legally binding with regard to everything else because it is a national emergency. Okay, now this is the Cherokee National Archives flow chart that I could come up with in its most simplistic form because it's really complicated. But what we ha have here is the Cherokee National Archives, and we have the archivist duties. Now, I talked earlier about duality existing. Okay, so there's the Cherokee National Historical Society tract and the Cherokee National Government tract. So government documents are on this tract right here. So Cherokee Nation, of course, creates the documents. It goes to Ruby at the warehouse. And it's supposed to find itself at the Cherokee National Archives, and then the archivist takes care of them from there. Now, Cherokee National Historical Society is, say, my cousin Regina over there that's filming me <laughs> donates. Say she's got five five-page correspondence to West Studi, and she wants to donate it to the Cherokee Heritage Center. By the way, her basket made it to West Studi. That's why I said that. Okay, say she donates his autograph to the Heritage Center. Okay, so what happens is I can either choose to accept it or not accept it based off of does it meet our mission statement, which is to preserve, promote, or teach Cherokee history or culture, which it would in that instance. So then, there's a Cherokee National Historical Society committee board. And they say, they vote yes or no. And then it goes all the way back to the Cherokee National Archives, and then I take care of it from there. So that's the most simplistic form. 
Ruby, did I do a good job explaining that? Okay. So now, <clears throat> collections, what are they? What have you got and how can I see them? I think that's pretty applicable because a lot of people really don't know how to approach the archives and how to do research. And I want you guys to. I want you to, well, not get your hands dirty, wear white gloves. But when you come down, I want you to get your hands dirty without getting your hands dirty. So our archives is made up of 1,155 linear feet of paper documents. And that covers everything from, let's say, post trelateers to present. Now, there is some 18th century stuff, but it's newspapers, and I'll go into that in, here in a little bit. Um, there's 3,250 volumes within our library. We do have a library. Um, it's primarily Cherokee books, so picture any Cherokee book ever written. Hopefully, we have it. And if we don't, maybe I need to get on the ball and order it. Okay, we have over 3,000 plus photographs and negatives. We have um, John Ross's daguerreotype with his wife. So that's very historically and culturally important for that time period. Um, we have, my favorite is uh, Ned Christie and his half brother. And they're wearing Cherokee hunting jackets, also AKA known as the Sequoia jacket. That's also pretty historically important because those were the last, what you would call indigenous garb that lasted into the early 20th century for our people. We also have over 800 audio materials. So CDs, uh, Mylar reels, old cassette tapes. We have 350 plus flat items. And I say flat items, and that can be anything from blueprints, posters, but most prominently is our Cherokee Nation land patent. And people don't know, but our land patent is a whole basis for us being here in Cherokee Nation. The government, for, the US government virtually ceded us, I, I think it was nine million acres. That included the Cherokee outlet to where the Pawnees are at. All the way it was supposed to go past the Rocky Mountains, but that there's some surveying done and some other things, you know. We never get a good deal, you know, it's the government. They're gonna screw you any way they can. Okay. <laughs> now, in addition, the Cherokee National Historical Society's collections, these are three-dimensional objects, anything from John Ross's furniture to cannonballs to uh, portraits, various assortments. Um, I'm going to use this estimate because there's so many different numbers. Anywhere from 5,500 objects to over 400,000. Now, I bet some people are saying, man, that math doesn't add up. That's a large discrepancy. Well, you're absolutely right. The problem is we need to do 100% inventory. And with our archival, archival move, as we're approaching the building, we're going to inventory 100%. So we'll actually know what's on hand, what meets our mission statement, and what doesn't. Because all this is important. I think the Cherokee people need accounting, accountability for that. Okay, what have you got? <laughs> so we have, obviously, I talked about, this is kind of the highlights of what we do have. We have the Cherokee Nation land pattern. We have the Lewis Ross papers. Um, Lewis Ross was John Ross's brother and he was treasurer for the Cherokee Nation. We have Admiral Jocko Clark's papers, famous World War II Admiral of the Pacific. We have the Earl Boyd Pierce collection. He was, we'll call him the second Cherokee Nation archivist. The first one being stalking turkey if we go by actual research. Okay, we have his papers. We have W.W. Keeler's principal chief papers. They would be akin to like presidential papers of Ronald Reagan. Then we have the W.W. Keeler Cherokee Nation government records. So those span from the 40s through the 70s. We have C.C. Victory. He was chairman of the Cherokee Nation Executive Committee. And that was at the time when we were running for, ch when we had a chief for a day government, the executive committee handled business decisions. Uh, Mary Wadley, she was the tribal secretary at the time. We have uh, Ross Swimmer, his principal chief papers, and also his 
Cherokee Nation government papers from his time periods. Um, we do have a few bills of sale from slaves from John Ross. That's part of our history. Um, I think every aspect of our history, whether we like it or not, needs to be told. We have newspapers from 1760 to 1924. We have, of course, the John Ross daguerreotype. Daguerreotype was the earliest form of photographs from the 1840s on. So that's pretty important. Man, it's like I, somebody was reading my mind or something. Ned Christie and his brother, Tintype. Okay, so that's in the archives. What about collections? Okay, we got Stan Wadey's Bowie knife. We had the safe that came over on the Trail of Tears. And when we were getting money from the Cherokee outlet, the money was actually deposited in that safe. There's a lot of history with that safe. <laughs> a lot of money too that passed through there. We have the John Ross parlor furniture. We have a Cherokee Braves flag. Now, with the Cherokee Braves flag, we haven't fully authenticated it yet, so it may be a possibility of a forge or it may actually be a real one. So we're in the process of ascertaining that information. We have a rattlesnake eff effigy shell gorget. That is from 1600s and before. It's real hard to date that off the top without doing archeological research into the record with the, with the typology. I'm, I have some archeological classes at the undergraduate level, but I'm not an archeologist. Even though some people think I'm like Indiana Jones, I'm not. <laughs> okay, we have, <laughs> we have uh, the President Jackson Grant and Adams Indian Peace Medals. Those are really important because what would happen is when a treaty was signed or you met with the president or other government official representing them, they would give you peace medals. You see it as a diplomatic tool to denote your status within the tribe because, you know, most of us in Indian country are real egalitarian. Everybody is equal. There's no stratification. There's no rich, no poor, no slaves, no masters, really. But the U.S. government and its predecessors like the British, Spanish, and French, they needed to create a... Uh, a... A... Ah, I, can't, I can't pronounce the words, but basically an aristocracy to deal with who's in charge. So they would issue these peace medals out. There is a, a Delaware bandolier bag. Now you're thinking, okay, why is a Delaware bandolier bag in our collections? The Delaware people were, became integrated into us, and even before there was intermarriage, and up until fairly recently, when they get, regained federal recognition, they were still part of Cherokee Nation. So I think it's significant that we give those due respects to the Delaware, to the Shawnee. We have Sequoia Indian Weavers Association sample. Now, that was a movement to establish a way to make money for our Cherokee people. So they got together, they created a way of making blankets with looms. And I, I probably didn't do it justice by describing it, but it was very important because it's a grassroots movement to make money for our Cherokee people when no economy exists. We're, we're, so, we're trying to be industrious. We're thinking about new ideas. And that just, that's a testament to that. We have 18th century trade beads. Um, trade beads was an item that was, you know, at different times we would trade, uh, like back in the old country, we would trade deer skins that were very popular in Europe. We would trade them by the pound. The deer almost went extinct in the Southeast. And one of the items was trade beads. Uh, J.B. Milam's desk. Before W.W. Keeler was chief for a day, there was J.B. Milam. We have uh, contemporary Cherokee pottery and baskets, booger mask, uh, syllabary print blocks, portraits and other arts, a Sequoia style jacket, and I'm going to put et cetera. We got mi Cherokee miscellanea. Okay, so how do I see it? Give me a call. My name is Jared Miller. If you don't know that by now, I'm the archivist. My number is area code 918-453-5454, extension 6152. Or 
jaredmiller at cherokee.org. So it sounds pretty dang simple. I just ask that you guys make an appointment two weeks in advance. And here's why. I want you guys to sit back, talk on the phone with me, and I'm going to try getting inside your head because I want you guys to have a really good experience when you come down and research. And I might find things in my archives that you didn't ask for that I think you might want to look at. So those two weeks gives me enough time to pull what you don't think you need. Possibly, possibly. And, and I, I will say um, our genealogical information, every, I get so many calls asking about genealogical information. And our archives in, in its present conception isn't where there will be every family. Okay, the only other thing is we do charge for images if you would like copies and it's $25, we scan it and it's $25 per image. It's our policies and procedures, and it's just the way it is. Can we get around it? I'm not going to put that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so this sounds too good to be true, is it? Is the Cherokee National Archives really too good to be true? And we, we have problems, and I want to talk about the problems to our community for a little bit. At present, the 1585 Act has not been enforced. And there's a good reason. You know, we've just been building up. We've been working with education. We've been building with Indian child welfare. Things like that, in my opinion, do I think archives is the most important thing in the world? Yes. Do I think there's more pressing things? Yes. And there's more pressing things. But right now, we're, we're at a point where we can address the archives deficiencies. Um, our archives is housed in the basement of the Cherokee Heritage Center. And I, I want to be real when I talk about this. I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. I'm not trying to say that poor us. This is, you know, our facility at the time was built based off of best practices. Infrastructures change and best practices change. And there's no constant temperature or relative humidity controlled. So, as I was talking about earlier, we want to preserve these documents for 1,200 years. Well, that's with consistent relative humidity, consistent temperature, uh, consistent love, basically. And we can't meet the needs in its present condition until our new archives facility is built. Uh, we're at gross capacity in our current, current situation in the archives. I can't take on new collections because our shelves are full. And that's a, that's a detriment. That's a detriment to our Cherokee people because we need to grow our collection. Um, I know the warehouse is at, or is at near gross capacity. We, we have a problem. Um, but there's hope. There's a silver lining and I'm going to talk about it. Um, unfortunately, there's one employee for the Cherokee National Archives the only archivist in Cherokee Nation right here. <laughs> and to truly get our archives where it needs to go, we need two additional full-time staff to be dedicated to our archives. We need two or three interns and trained volunteers are needed. But you have to look at it from the perspective. I can train people till the cows come home, but it takes away from the mission needs of our archives. That's why we need two additional full-time trained staff in the field that have their undergraduates, their masters, their Cherokee Nation citizens. We want them. You know, we need them. Um, we have one records manager for Cherokee Nation. And I, I think that's also something, I'm sure Ruby could use the work over there. <laughs> they keep her too busy, you know, and we need to address that. We need to cement the relationship between the archives and our warehouse. How does it go? How do our documents flow from one part to another? Like on that um, flow chart, the problem I, I didn't show on that flow chart is there's a blockage. There's a blockage with policy. There's a blockage with having an adequate facility right now. There, there's a blockage because we have the gross capacity. Um, 
our archives is currently housed above a water pipe in our, our basement. We can lose our collections at any time. That's the sheer reality. I expect a phone call at any given time saying, hey, the archives is flooded out. And as an archivist, that's my worst nightmare. And it's a hard truth to swallow. And I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus when I say these things, but I'm identifying as a professional in this field specific problems that are endangering our collective documents. You have plans to build? A new facility, yes. Um, but we don't have the budget, equipment, or staff to meet its current demands. So, what can we do? <laughs> well, for starters, off to the right is our new archives facility. We're expecting it to be at 10,000 square foot. The archives facility is in the works and is currently in its bidding process right now. So that means it's being bidded out to construction interest to build it. This new archives facility will address issues of temperature, relative humidity, water threats, that's a big one, and fire damage. Um, I want to use this story real quick. Down in Brazil, their national museums burn up because they didn't have a fire suppression system. Over 10 million indigenous items from the Brazilian tribes are forever lost. Some of those tribes are extinct. So that means the existence of a whole people has been wiped out because there wasn't fire suppression systems, because there wasn't, uh, there wasn't um, water, you know, it, it wasn't built right to meet the needs of their people. With this also, we expect 5,280 square feet dedicated to collections. So if, knock on wood, if we get collapsible shelving, we can address 6,000 linear feet of document storage. And currently our collection is at 1,552 linear feet. So that means we'll be able to take on some of what's at the warehouse of our documents. We want to be good neighbors and good partners for the Cherokee people. Now, sometime back, I was given a task to what are the proposed costs for running the archives. This is from the perspective of what would it take to have the best archives in Indian country. We're the Cherokee people. We produce Sequoia. We produce Will Rogers for his humor. I'm sure he's not the funniest Cherokee that's ever lived, but we produce great people, great minds. We're forerunners in our field. We're a leader in Indian country. This is what it takes to be a leader in the archives and museum fields. This would put us past the Chickasaws. So what we would essentially need is anywhere from $518,000 to $692,000 a year. That's to include the cost of running the archives, to keep the internet up, to keep the water running, to keep the electricity and gas turned on. Um, that would be diesel for the generator. That would include staff salaries. That includes fringe benefits as package at Cherokee Nation um, operations, a modest acquisitions budget. So that means we can, if, for example, I'll use this story. Um, back in 2004 on eBay, there was a Cherokee Conjures medicine bundle for sale. And it had uh, um, the sacred affiliatedness with it. It was being sold in Ohio for $500. Items like that should never be sold first and foremost. But this gives us an alternative means to address if something comes up on eBay. What if there's a historical document that is so culturally or historically significant, this gives us the opportunity to buy it. Okay, so it also covers travel and professional development. We don't want an archivist that doesn't have, you want your archivist consistently trained in it, their field because technology is forever, forever jumping. It's forever evolving and we gotta keep up with it to meet the needs of today's challenge. That also from that professional development comes the need to do outreach for our communities. This budget covers a staff of three, what it would take to be professionals 
as an archivist on par with the Society of American Archivist Standards. Okay, now I want to talk about fully implementing the 1585 Act. Um, every nation state from time memorial has had an archives to validate its nation state. Think back to Babylon, Persia, Greece, Egypt. They all had archives. Cherokee Nation has an archives. But we're archives with the little A instead of the capital A. Okay. Um, by fully implementing it, we preserve and perpetuate the history of 365,000 Cherokee Nation citizens. I'm sure that number has grown quite a bit, but that does include a larger body of stakeholders. Cherokees come into contact our history with the Creeks, Chickasaws, Choctaw. It affects their history as well. It affects the United States history, Oklahoma's history. We're a significant cultural, linguistic, and sovereign group here in Oklahoma. So we play into the part of Oklahoma, but also the region, Arkansas, Texas, New Mexico, California, all these places have been impacted by Cherokees being there at different times. Think the Dust Bowl. That's how Cherokee Nation is now the largest tribe in the state of California. We have over 24,000 members and citizens. So we're impacting Cherokee history in California. Um, implementing the future today. I want to present three case scenarios. I'm not advocating for anyone. I'm apolitical. I'm just presenting uh, you know, my professional opinions. This is what happens if we do the status quo. We remain at our current pace and relationship. And here's what the outcome is. Endangerment of documents and non-compliance of tribal law. Okay, we have our government option. Okay, Cherokee Nation can absorb the Cherokee National Archives into the Cherokee Nation proper as either its own separate department or under department. The outcome it ensures budgetary needs for archives and preservation work. Okay, now I'm going to present a third option, which is the endowment option. And it's a fundraiser initiative, and it creates the Cherokee National Archives as a semi-autonomous unit that is ran financially from designated funds from government or from interested parties. And what happens is off of that endowment, once a dollar figure is reached, the archives is run off its interest. And that would cover everything from the light bulbs to the archivist being paid theoretically. The outcome it ensures the need for archives and preservation work. So that's three case scenarios I'm presenting. And again, I'm not telling the Cherokee people what to pick. I'm just, as a professional, I'm just presenting options in a discourse. We're having a dialogue is all. Okay, future growth of the archives. Okay, this is very important. Okay, because we need to look at language, government records, and outreach. Okay, I want to cover language first. Earlier, I apologized to our language population. Um, for that reason, we're designated in a section of the archives solely for the language. We're going to be become a centralized repository for all syllabary documents, both copies and original. That is our goal. Um, there's an emphasis put on language first. So when we pull the boxes in the archives, it's going to be written in the syllabary and little tiny English letters because I, I think I think as Cherokee people, we need to put Cherokee first. Okay, for our government records, I say we need to bring home original pre-statehood Cherokee Nation government documents and repatriate them back to our Cherokee Nation. Um, international government documents. You will find Cherokee government documents in Great Britain. You will find them in Spain, Mexico, France, and Canada, some Caribbean nations. So we need to reach out to them. We need to contact their embassies as a government to government relationship on an international level and bring home these correspondence. They involve our people and we want to tell our people's history. That's the best way to do it is how those, those colonial groups back in the 18th century, back in the 19th century viewed us and what was going on. I was reading about what 
some of Mexico has. And there was an initiative back in the late 1890s for Cherokee migration to Mexico. And it deals in the correspondence between the U.S. government and the Mexican consulate about what's going on there. There was an Anglo gentleman that was also representing the Cherokee Nation. He wasn't really representing them, but he said he was representing them, trying to buy land on our behalf. So somebody was speaking for us who wasn't appointed. Shame on them. But that's been a consistent history. We have people that falsely represent the Cherokee Nation at times in our history. Another thing I want to do is outreach. And what the big question I have, what are the needs of our Cherokee citizens and how can the archives help? Um, I want to build collaborative partnerships today in today's events for tomorrow's history. Um, our, our Cherokee heads of department, they are so important because let's take, for example, the language, the immersion school. Let's, somebody eventually got the idea for that and they might have wrote it on a cocktail napkin. That cocktail napkin might be historically significant because it was a seed for the idea. You know, I write little sticky notes. I doubt it'll go in the archives for posterity, but great ideas come on different documents and we need to preserve those. Outreach to Cherokee communities at home and abroad. I use the term abroad for at large, but we need to reach out to Salem, Oklahoma, to Bell, Oklahoma, to Nycutt, we need to figure out a way to bring our Cherokee documents to them because those are our Cherokee citizens and there's a disconnect currently. We need to address that. Um, Long-term partnerships with institutions and other government. We need to play nice. We need to diplomatically, of course. And for example, we have Cherokee documents that were, and I'm going to use the term tactically acquired and I think that's a good way of putting it, that are at Harvard and Yale. And those should have never been digitized. They should have never been out for the public. They didn't come to us and ask, and yet they're there. So perhaps a better way, instead of going directly the NAGPRA route, is to go the partnership route. Let's create long-term lasting partnerships. And I think that's a viable solution. The archives, everything for me is done with the servant's heart. First question I have, what is our community needs? It takes a village to assist a problem. I want to approach it from our cultural philosophies. Um, do you think that right way of living? I want to approach it. How can we incorporate Cherokee philosophy in running our archives? Um, more importantly, hospitality like at the table or on the front porch with grandma. You know, nobody's a stranger. Um, you know, we're very inclusive people. Anybody that comes to our archives is welcome. And I'll use this example. Right now, Cherokee Nation's in a billion dollar lawsuit with the federal government. We had the researchers for the federal government come down for a month. And I treated them like I would any other patron because our archives is apolitical and we need to show that hospitality culturally. Another thing I want to ask, what can we do to assist our language and culture? You know, we have a culture and language driven focus here at the nation. Um, we need a focus on centralizing Cherokee documents pertaining to language and culture. If it's been written about us, we need to centralize it in one place. The archives has been designated as the official repository. We shouldn't have different places where it's at. And any Cherokee Nation citizen should be able to come to me and say, hey, do you have this document? And I go, yes, absolutely. And I hope to get there one day. <laughs> um, we want to generate meeting spaces to provide material for constructed discourse in our community. Now, us Cherokee historically have been divided. You have the treaty party and you have the non-treaty party, and it's a very um, volatile situation. Let's create constructive dialogue. Um, I don't interpret history, I just present the documents to y'all. 
it is the person that's reading it, that writes about it, that talks about it. That is their documents. Um, we need a grassroots model and training for Indian country. I think our archives provides that, that basis for establishing um, occupational training for young up and coming Cherokees in this field that may go on to the Smithsonian, they may go on to Gilcrease, Crystal Bridges. I think it's an opportune time and place for it. Um, more importantly, how can we be a part of the Cherokee Nation family? We want to tell the Cherokee story by preserving our written record unimpeded by outside influence. We shouldn't have the American government telling us who we are. We are the people that define our legacy. And it should be us. It's a culture, it's a community-driven focus. How can we assist our Cherokee Nation government? I want anybody from any department at any time to come on down and say, hey, do you have this? And I hope to answer, yes, absolutely I do. And how can I better assist you? How can we be a good friend to our relatives and community? This is an interesting group of people talking or in this room. I have my ICW family over there. I have my Dr. Gord, who I work with at the Cherokee Heritage Center. I have my wife over there. I have my cousin over there. We're all community. We're all Cherokees. And that's a beautiful thing. The commonality is our citizenship, our shared history, our shared past. And archives is just one aspect of that, those historical documents. And also objects. Now, the end for now. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody. It, it's a dry topic, I know. Um, I want to present just the facts. And I wanted y'all to know what we're faced with, what we're doing, and how you can be a part of it. Because I don't think this dialogue has been had yet, and we need to have it.